Hey guys, Carlson here to start our Unit 9 video lectures with you over Chapter 15, the Respiratory System. Uh, we're just going to get through 15.1 and 15.5 today, and we're going to talk about how our cells obtain energy through an aerobic process that requires oxygen and produces carbon dioxide. This exchange takes place within the lungs at air-filled pockets called alveoli. They have a thin, delicate surface to allow for rapid diffusion between the air and the blood, and this is the respiratory system connection with the cardiovascular system because it provides the link between the interstitial fluids and the exchange surface of the lungs through our circulating blood. Now, 15.1, we're going to talk about the two different portions of the respiratory system, the air conducting and respiratory portions. Um, there are five main functions that they are providing, a large area for gas exchange, um, moving air to and from the gas exchange surfaces that we just mentioned, those alveoli, protect surfaces from dehydration, temperature change in pathogens, produce sounds from any speech, singing, etc., and aiding in the sense of smell by olfactory receptors in the nasal cavity. So our major anatomical structures include the nose, the pharynx, larynx, trachea, bronchi, and lungs. Um, this picture here shows you our nasal cavities located here, our pharynx, then we drop down into our larynx, down to our trachea and our two bronchi and um, our two bronchi that lead into our lungs. Now our bronchi and lungs actually contain these bronchioles or air conducting passageways uh, which lead into the alveoli, that gas exchange surface, and you will we'll be looking at a closer up picture of this here soon, but this is where those alveoli are going to be located. Now the respiratory tract is just passageways that carry air to and from the lungs and that upper conducting portion begins at the entrance to the nasal cavity, continues through the pharynx, larynx, trachea, bronchi, and larger bronchioles, and they are lined with respiratory mucosa uh, made up of ciliated columnar epithelium. Their function is to deliver air to the lungs, filter warm and humidify it. This helps protect alveoli from debris, pathogens, and environmental extremes. That lower respiratory portion is going to include the smallest and most delicate bronchioles and the alveoli within the lungs. Contamination is prevented by that respiratory mucosa, like we mentioned, because the mucus bays the exposed surfaces from the nasal cavity to the bronchi. Cilia here is going to sweep mucus and any trapped debris or microorganisms toward the pharynx where it can be swallowed and exposed to acids and enzymes in the stomach and taken care of. 15.2, uh, we're going to talk about these structures in a little more detail. So our nose uh, provides airway entry through the external nares, nares of the nostrils. There's a septum that divides the two sides of the cavity while the cavity opens into the nasopharynx at the internal nares. If we are exposed to noxious vapors, large quantities of dust, debris, allergens, whatever, this usually results in an increase in the rate of mucus production or what we call a runny nose. Now our pharynx or throat is chambered uh, and it's shared by the digestive and respiratory systems. It extends between the internal nar nares and entrances to the larynx and esophagus. It has three subdivisions and kind of where it's located is indicated by its prefix. Nasopharynx in the nasal cavity, oropharynx um, extends from the soft palate and the base of the tongue, and then our laryngopharynx, which extends between the level of the hyoid bone and the entrance to the esophagus. Uh, they are all lined with stratified squamous epithelial because it resists mechanical abrasion, chemical attack, and pathogen invasion for all of the stresses that's received to this area. So again, a closer up look, we have our nasal cavity, external nares, internal nares, uh, leading into the pharynx, the nasopharynx section, the oropharynx behind your tongue, and that soft palate, and then the laryngopharynx uh, right back here, where we're about to extend into the esophagus, and over here we have your trachea. So, uh, let's talk more about the larynx now, or our voice box, which consists of nine cartilages stabilized by ligaments, skeletal muscles, or both. The three largest include uh, that epiglottis, which is shoehorn shaped, prevents liquids and food in from entering during swallowing. Um, we have our thyroid cartilage, which forms that Adam's apple, and the cricoid cartilage, which, which just provides more posterior support. Um, air le leaves the pharynx and enters the larynx through a narrow opening called the glottis, um, which is this area right here. Um, food or liquids that touch any of the vocal cords through this area is actually what triggers our coughing reflex. And we'll talk more about the vocal cords in class. Um, the trachea and the bronchi are what we're going to talk about next. The trachea is also known as your windpipe. It's tough, flexible, uh, moves air. And uh, it can easily distort along large masses of food to pass along the esophagus. Uh, sympathetic stimulation can increase the diameter of the trachea uh, when you're needing to make it easier for uh, large volumes of air to flow. The bronchi in each lung uh, branch into smaller and smaller arrows that form that bronchial tree. 
Uh, once branched to a narrow one millimeter, uh, cartilage is going to completely disappear and give rise to our bronchioles. They're dominated by smooth muscle tissue, um, activity is regulated by the ANS, and the bronchioles are to our respiratory system as our arterioles are to our cardiovascular system because they control airflow and distribution to the lungs. Sympathetic activation can stimulate bronchodilation, which is enlargement of the airway, or bronchoconstriction, which is a reduction of the airway. And when we have extreme reduction, we actually have a blocked airway, which is usually what we see in an asthma attack. Let me go back to that real quick. Um, this picture here, again, is just trying to get us closer and closer to those bronchioles and that alveoli surface. So you have your trachea, bronchi continuing to branch down. So this is kind of like half of that bronchial tree, smaller and smaller to the bronchioles. And finally to the terminal bronchioles, which we're about to get into here. So um, the smallest bronchioles, uh, like I said, they, they're called the terminal bronchioles that even eventually lead into what we call respiratory bronchioles. And uh, they supply air to the lobules of the lungs, and each lobule is a segment of lung tissue bounded by connected tissue partitions. Within each terminal uh, bronchial, we have that branch into the respiratory bronchioles that I just mentioned. Um, this is how we deliver air to the alveoli, um, which is the thinnest area of the branches of the bronchial tree. So again, even closer up look, bronchioles, terminal bronchial, respiratory bronchial, and then we have these alveoli. There's a bunch of them here in this pulmonary or lung lobule. All right, um, respiratory bronchioles open into passageways called the al alveolar ducts. These ducts will end at the alveolar sacs or chambers connected to many, many um, alveoli. Like I said, there's 150 million of these in the entire lung, and so that's what gives it that open, spongy appearance. Uh, the metabolic requirements demand the alveolar exchange surface to be very large, about the size of half a tennis court. And scattered among this surface is going to be septal cells that produce an oily secretion called surfactant. Th these play a key role in keeping the alveoli open. They reduce surface tension to keep the alveolar walls from collapsing. And if we have inadequate levels of surfactant, this could result in a popped alveoli, which is usually genetic or from injury. And this causes respiratory distress syndrome because your lungs are deflated, making it difficult for the body to keep them open and up. Now, the respiratory membrane is where gas exchange occurs at the alveoli. The membrane is made of three layers, squamous epithelial lining, endothelial cells will line an adjacent capillary, and then the fused basement membrane lies between the alveolar and endothelial cells. So the short distance allows for rapid exchange of gases. Uh, we receive blood from arteries of the pulmonary circuit, and those pulmonary arteries bring deoxygenated blood. They enter the lungs, branch uh, following the bronchi to the lobules. The lobules receive an arteriole and a network of capillaries where oxygen-rich blood from these capillaries is gonna pass through the pulmonary venules and into the venous system to deliver oxygenated blood back to the left atrium of the heart. Now, blockage of a pulmonary artery will stop blood flow to a group of lobules and cause something uh, known as a pulmonary embolism, which is something very, very dangerous that obviously wants to be avoided. Now, breakdown of our lungs is basically that we have two of them. They have distinct lobes that are separated by deep, deep fissures that you can see in this diagram here. The right lung has three, a superior, middle, and inferior lobe, while the left lung only has two, a superior and a inferior one. The blunt rounded apex of the lungs extends into the base of the neck above the first rib and then the area, uh, inferior portion would be known as the base of the lungs. Now we have uh, two pleural cavities within the thoracic cavity that will surround uh, each lung. Um, each pleural cavity is lined by a serous membrane called the pleura. Uh, the parietal pleura covers the inner surface of the body wall and extends over the diaphragm and mediastinum. So you can see that here. Um, here's the mediastium, the tissue in between. Um, the visceral pleura, which visceral usually means organ, this is one that covers the outer surface of the lung. We see this here, and extends into the fissures between the lobes. Uh, the two cavities are separated again by the mediastium. Um, both of the layers secrete a small amount of fluid that can be obtained for diagnostic purposes within their membranes, um, and we would extract this through a thoracentesis, which would be a puncture into the cavity. 15.4, we're going to talk about external and internal respiration real quick. These are just the two processes involved in respiration. So external is all the processes involved in gas exchange of oxygen and carbon dioxide between body's interstitial fluids and the external environment. The purpose is to meet respiratory demands and it involves three steps. 
pulmonary ventilation or breathing, gas diffusion at two different sites, and transport of oxygen and carbon dioxide between the alveolar capillaries and the capillary beds of other tissues. While internal respiration is just the absorption of oxygen and release of carbon dioxide by those cells. So that's the cellular level. Any abnormalities that could occur would be a decline in oxygen concentration resulting in hypoxia, which limits metabolic activity of that area. Now, if we completely cut oxygen off, we have anoxia, which would cause rapid cell death, and we usually see this in strokes and heart attacks. Last section we're going to cover is 15.5, which uh, digs deeper into pulmonary ventilation. So this is a physical movement of air into and out of the respiratory tract. And a single breath or respiratory cycle consists of inhalation or inspiration, exhalation or expiration. So inhalation taking breath, uh, air in, exhalation taking it out. The respiratory rate is the number of breaths per minute and a normal adult is about 12 to 18 per minute while a child is much uh, more frequent, 18 to 20 per minute. Uh, breathing functions to maintain adequate alveolar ventilation, movement of air into and out of the alveoli. This prevents buildup of carbon dioxide and ensures continuous supply of oxygen to be absorbed by the bloodstream. Uh, last few breathing tidbits, uh, compliance of the lungs is an indication of how easily they expand. The lower the compliance, the greater is the force required to fill and empty it and vice versa. Modes of breathing include two types, quiet breathing. Inhalation involves muscular contractions, but exhalation is very passive. This is during normal activities. Forced breathing, both inhalation and exhalation are active during and increased activities. Long volumes and capacities include tidal volume, which is when at rest, the amount of air you move into or and out of your lungs during a single respiratory cycle. Uh, quiet breathing averages about 500 milliliters. Vital capacity is a max amount of air that can be moved into and out of the respiratory system in a single cycle. And residual volume is the amount of air that remains in the lungs even after maximal exhalation, which is usually about 1,200 milliliters in males and 1,100 millimeter, milliliters in females, which keeps the lungs nice and expanded and not just deflated at any time. All right, we'll cover 15.6 later, and then I will talk to you guys next time.